Good. All right. Great. Great. Uh, so very glad to be here with you to open the conference and talking about the image of God. What exactly is it? You know, this has been a subject that has been somewhat elusive throughout the history of the church, for that matter, the history of the Bible as well. And so we're going to tackle it today in some complexity, though I've streamlined it a little bit, and I'm going to try to bring some of the subject matters down so we can pay the very important thing that we see runs throughout the strand of of, of the whole of the scriptures. Now, I'll tell you this, just like uh, Prof Professor Thurman, President Thurman communicated, we believe that the Bible is inspired and inerrant. And as such, this presentation will be pretty much a, an understanding of biblical theology as we look at this idea from a systematic perspective. So let's start considering the psalmist in Psalm chapter 8 as David himself uh, reflects and, um, and thinks thoroughly as he looks into the night sky at who God is as he is reflective of the creation that he has made. His invisible attributes, eternal power, divine nature are clearly seen. But then he asks the question, well, not only who is God, but who am I? We pick up with this particular uh, uh, evocation of praise. In fact, it's the same evocation of praise that we find at the very end of Psalm. As David says, O Lord, our Lord, Yahweh, our Adonai, that is the covenant name of God as well as a reflection of him as master. And some even interpret this as king because he is the true king. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic, how awe-evoking is your name, your reputation in all the earth. And then we see a couple of choruses. I'm going the wrong direction. There we go. The first chorus that we look at is found in uh, verses 1 through 4, 1b through 4. He starts by thinking about the heavens. You've set your glory above the heavens. Uh, and out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy of the avenger. I recall as a young man at living on the outskirts of the Ozark Mountains, going out in the evening and looking at the sky much easier than I can now, and seeing the beauty of God's creation. And it would often cause me to think about God and to reflect on His majesty. But when we look at the second aspect of this particular verse, we think about what Jesus communicated in Matthew 21 after he had cleansed the temple, as, as after he had healed the blind as well as the lame. Many of the scribes and the Pharisees were complaining that the children were crying, Hosanna. And he quotes this particular passage communicating that even the simple and the most innocent recognize the majesty of God. And then he says in verse 3, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have made, here's the question, what is man? Who am I? What is man that you are mindful of me or the son of man that you care for me? That word son of man uh, relates to the fact that God is completely independent. Yet man has a source. He is the son of man. Going back to Genesis chapter 5, it speaks of our frailty. It speaks of our littleness. It reminds me of a story by Teddy Roosevelt, who at Sagmore Hill was standing outside with William Beebe. He walked out and he pointed to the sky. As he looked up, he said, look there, there is the square Pegasus. That is the spiral galaxy of Andromeda. It is as large as the Milky Way. It is one of a hundred million galaxies and consists of a hundred billion stars, each larger than the sun. He paused and with a smirk on his face said, now I think we are small enough, let's go to bed. As he moves from who are we, as he moves from asking the question, who am I? We then see in the second half, a reflection on what God has communicated within his word. This isn't necessarily something that he found himself, that is, David. It's something that he read, that God revealed to him. Yet you have made him a little lower than... Here we have the interpretation heavenly beings. The word here is Elohim. 
I personally think, because Elohim is most, most times used for the name of God, that is what is referred to here. You have made him a little lower than God. Probably reflective of what we read in Genesis 1.27, understanding that man was made in the image of God. You've made him a little lower than God and you've crowned him with glory and honor. That is, you have placed him in a preeminent place in your creation. You have given him honor. This is the idea of preeminence. But also, the idea of crowning him with glory. This that is a holistic perspective of the biblical interpretation as well as a theological understanding of what's going on here would un be understood as God has given man in being made in his image the privilege of reflecting his glory. That is, that was the purpose and the intention for which God had made him, that man might reflect the very glory of God to his creation. You have given him dominion, that is authority, over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep, all oxen, all the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish, the sea, and whatever passes along the seas. Of course, if you are, uh, if you are familiar with Genesis 1, 26 and 27, then you would recognize that God commanded man male and female, to fill the earth, to inhabit it, and then also gave them dominion. And this is reflective of that very mandate. And then we conclude with the second evocation of praise as we began the psalm. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So as we begin this particular study, last year I had the opportunity of talking on this subject and I had a, quite a few questions about uh, where exactly I received this material, or you may be in that particular situation where you would like to uh, study a little bit further. If that is you, then over on the Brooks table, you will find a bibliography of about 40 references, journal articles, books, things of that nature that will help you to be able to uh, take your education of the image of God further. Uh, today, a lot of the communication is going to be based on a few books. One here is Dignity and Destiny by a fellow named Kilner. It's about 350 pages, pretty exhaustive, uh, but at the same time, it's also a little bit repetitious. What Kilner really helps us do is kind of boil down some of the concepts that we can understand from a holistic perspective, the true value as well as the implications of what it means to be made in the image and likeness. Also, Richard Lentz, in his um, Identity and Idolatry, lends quite a bit of information and help to understand the purpose of the image throughout Scripture. Uh, his is part of the series, New Studies in uh, Biblical Theology, and so you would receive a lot of value in reading this book as well. Next, we have a book that's been around for a generation or two by Hokema, The Image of God. Uh, this is a good book that has a couple of chapters on what the image of God is, as well as a survey from a historical perspective, the various uh, theologians throughout the history of the church and what they have said about the image of God. He takes a little bit more of what we would call an anthropological approach. That is, he deals with the doctrine of man throughout this book. Also, if you are a lay individual and you're looking for a shorter read, something that's about 50 or 60 pages, R.C. Sproul has a pretty good book, as you see right here. Uh, next, from a historical perspective, I would highly recommend Athanasius on the Incarnation. Uh, a lot of his ideas and concepts we're going to be seeing tomorrow in the image of God's salvation history. And then finally, if you're considering or want to reflect on how the image would uh, be very relevant as well as application-oriented in uh, ethical considerations, I think Magnuson has a, a, a very good grasp of what the image of God is and how it affects ethics in his um, book on ethics. So let's move now to get into the nuts and bolts of our presentation with the image defined. And as we're going to consider what exactly the image of God is, uh, as of course we need to, we need to look at Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 as well as verse 27. As we think about the creation narrative found in Genesis chapter 1, and then also we look at the, the, the expansion in Genesis chapter 2, 
we remember that God created the world in six days. The first day he created the light. Uh, the second day he separated the waters from the sea as well as the waters from the heavens and the, and the sky. We know on the third day that uh, he, he caused plants to grow on the land as well as the land to appear from the water. And then almost in poetic fashion we read in uh, in Genesis chapter 1 of day 4 through 6 parallel in day 1 through 3 as on day 4 he put the celestial bodies into the heavens the sun and the moon as well as the stars day 5 he created the birds and the and then on day 6 he made the land animals and at the pinnacle of his creation he made humanity and in verse 26 and 27 we have that depiction of the creation of humanity then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Now, as we look at this particular text, I can't be exhaustive, of course, but I want you to notice a few observations in comparison with the particular creation on the days prior to that as we compare the two. Um, I want you to reflect on the fact that man, as relates to the other creation, is special and he is purposeful, being the pinnacle of God's creation. The first thing I want you to notice is that man is God's final and pinnacle creation. Secondly, when we consider the wording that is used in the creation of man, we see different language. Let us make man versus let there be or let the land or let the sea. And so that helps us to understand not only uh, is there a difference, but man is created directly. We'll come back to that here in just a second. Man also is given authority or dominion and is called to rule over the created order. When we look at this particular verse, we see in the Hebrew the idea of make, create, that is specifically bara, that is used three times. Continuing on with the purposefulness as well as the, the special aspect of man and his creation, we think about the fact that the event of man's creation is given a longer description than the previous descriptions. Also, when you look at verse 26 and especially verse 27, you're going to see that 27 is arranged in a poetic format and in a functional aspect of that poetry, what we call a chiastic structure, the very middle of the poetry uh, focuses on the concept of image, that is man being made in the image of God. And then finally, only mankind is referred to as a direct creation, as opposed to let there be, let the land, let the water. God said, let us make man in our image. When we look at the expansion of the creation narrative in chapter 2, we see, for instance, in verse 7, as somewhat contrasted with what we read in 1, 26 and 27, the frailty of man. We see the same creation, but this creation is perceived from the perspective of God taking the dust from the ground and forming the Lord God then took the uh, to, the Lord God formed the man, that is, another word would be crafted, crafted the man from the dust, from the ground, uh, once again speaking of the fragility of who man is, and then he breathed, we might say animate, which would mean to give life, he gave life to the man in his nostrils, the breath of life that is, and the man became a living creature. Uh, just a point here of notation, this does speak to the purposefulness as well as the specialization of the creation of man, 
But I would encourage you not to see the breath of life as synonymous with or the same as the idea of image. There will be a little bit difference, and I think you will see that as we look at some of the other passages that relate to the concept of image, especially, for instance, found in Genesis chapter 9 or as well in Genesis chapter 5, where we see that the image is going to relate to the whole of the humanity, that is, the whole of who he is. Continuing on, when we think about the idea of image and likeness, uh, we want to maybe go and boil down and look at the wording that is used within the context of Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And there are two words that are used, of course, man is made in the image. The word here in this passage is tselem. Tselem is an image or a copy, a form of something. But we think about what the original readers would have understood the image to be because it was not um, something that would have been unusual within the day of Moses and his writing for the people to have been familiar of a certain king who would have uh, made a certain image of himself in a land that was far from his original place of authority and rulership and that particular image would represent him. Just like when God created man in his image, he placed him, we would say, as a vice regent within his creation realm. One who was to represent him. Because the idea of Selim does have the concept of representation. Uh, The second idea that is used is that of demut, which is likeness. It relates to the idea of form, similitude, or to have the pattern after something. And we're going to see a similar language that is used a little bit later on for the idea of the tabernacle. But as we consider the idea of image and likeness, we're going to ask a few questions relating to how it's used not only in this passage, but well as well within the creation narrative and the first few ch- uh, chapters of the book of Genesis. And one of the questions we're going to ask is, there a distinction between the idea of image and likeness? Another question that we're going to ask is, does the image include the body? And then yet another question that we're going to ask is, do we still obtain the image of God? First, let's ask the question, should there be a strong distinction between the idea of image and likeness? Because throughout the history of the church, there have been certain theologians that did give a strong distinction. For instance, one of my favorite theologians, though I admittedly disagree with him on this particular aspect, is Irenaeus of uh, Lyons in the second century uh, AD. Irenaeus communicated that the image related to the aspect of who we are when we think about the concepts of, uh, of, of, of being made in God's image of who we are right now. So we might think of uh, the aspect of of morality as opposed to the idea of likeness that would relate to the idea of righteousness. So being in the image of God was something that we still retain, the idea of authority or having some aspect though it would have been um, would have, would have been blemished as to where the likeness was completely lost, this idea of the righteousness of God, and needed to be regained. So, so the question then is posed from an exegetical or from a biblical perspective, is there a difference between the idea of image and likeness? Well, when we look at Genesis chapter 5 and verses 1 through 3, we see a parallel with Genesis 1.27. Genesis 1.27, it said... God communicated, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Here in verse 1 of chapter 5, looking at the beginning of a genealogy, this is the book of generations of Adam, and then in a summary fashion of what we see in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Now you'll notice that. You don't have made him in the image and after the likeness. You simply have the description in the likeness of God which communicates this is a summary of what it means to be made in the image as well as after or according to the likeness. 
we're going to see if you continue to read on that the image of Adam is then also communicated to the image of his son Seth. But notice this, that the prepositions that are used as well as the wording itself is reversed. His son, Seth, was made in his likeness as opposed to his, in his image and after the image as opposed to after the likeness of what we see in Genesis chapter 1 and 26. Once again, that tells us that we shouldn't put too much distinction within the concepts of image and likeness and we should understand them as an emphasis of who we are as relates to a purpose for God in making us. And if I could boil it down maybe into a couple of concepts, I would communicate that what does it mean to be made in the image of God? It means that God has an intent and a purpose for humanity. And that purpose see, be clearly indicated as we move on and look at some of the other ideas that relate to the image especially the concepts of glory. We'll get there here in just a second. All right. As we look at some parallels from Genesis 1, 26 and 27, one of the reflections deals with the idea of the tabernacle. The tabernacle is a place of worship, just like the Garden of Eden was a place of worship, as man was made after the likeness of God. So also the tabernacle is made as a pattern or in this regard a pattern after after that which was in heaven and see that you make them that is these descriptions that God is giving Moses after the pattern for them which is being shown to you on the mountain let's ask some of those other questions does humanity humanity still possess the image there would be those who would state that we completely lost the image and it need to be absolutely restored. But when we look at the scripture, we see that there are implications that we still do retain the image. For instance, in the New Testament, James communicates with it, that is our tongue, we bless the Lord and Father, and with our tongue, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. No understanding in Genesis chapter 5 how likeness was a summary for the idea of image and likeness. Here we would recognize James communicates that we are still made in the image and likeness of God. And as we think about what that means to be angry and to curse one who is made in the image and after the likeness of God is an affront to God himself. Or let's think, for instance, also about the statement of Jesus in Luke chapter 20, verses 24 and 25. When Jesus was asked by the religious leadership, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Because they were trying to paint him into a corner. He responded by asking for a coin that represented a day's work, the denarius. And so they gave him a coin and he asked whose image was on it. Well, they said, well, it's the image of Caesar. And then he communicated, well, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God's the things that are God's. By implication, if someone's picture was stamped on it, it meant it belonged to them. So Jesus, using that very simple logic, communicated if Caesar's image is on the coinage, then give to Caesar that which is Caesar's. But the parallel idea that Jesus communicates when he says, and give God the things that are God's, would also implicate that there is something that God's image is stamped upon. And that would be Caesar himself, or you, or me. And so the idea of giving God the things that are God's means that he owns us and we should render complete submission to him. By implication, yet once again, we still attain the image of God. Now that we've answered some of these questions about do we still retain the image, well, let's ask, well, does the image include the body? Because there are some who've stated that it is only the soul. A.W. Tozer believes it's only the soul. John Calvin also has communicated that the image relates only to the soul. But I think that there is good biblical warrant also to understand that the image includes the body. For instance, as we think about what is found in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6 after the flood and we are discussing the Noahic covenant, 
God communicates, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man his blood shall be shed, for God made man in his own image. By implication, man being an image bearer of God, number one communicates we still do have the image, yes, but also number two, that murder would result in another or that man's blood being shed. Why? Because he destroyed a man's life. And the reason is because that man's life whom he destroyed, that body that he struck, was made within the image of God. Therefore, there seems to be good warrant and inferential information to understand that here it is assumed that man or the body also is part of what it means to be created in the image of God. Also, let's reflect on a few other ideas relating to does the image include the body. When we go back to Genesis chapter 5 and we think about how Adam was made in the likeness of God, and we see it communicated that also was created in the likeness and after the image of Adam, that particular idea, the communication of the image that is communicated to Seth from Adam seems to assume all that Adam is relates also to Seth that would include the body. And so, therefore, the general implication that being created in the image and likeness encompasses all of who, who humanity is. And to be frank with you, I think the strongest implication or answer to does the body, is the body included in the image, is found within the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Just as Jesus is the very image of God and the truth of the incarnation that helps us to understand the importance of the body as it relates to Christ as well as his resurrection. So if we were to go back and we were to review some of these beginning ideas relating to what it means to be made in the image and after the likeness of God, we would recognize and understand that that means that we are special and purposeful as there has been a longer sequence of creation descriptive of humanity, as we see that man was created directly and he was created male and female as opposed to in mass like we see with birds or with the fish or with the other creatures, that humanity also, having not necessarily stated that, is made male and female, which speaks once again to the specificity of the sex of the maleness as well as the femaleness within creation. And so there is a very purposeful aspect in the creation of humanity. That includes also the body of humanity. And we also still retain the image of God as well. Now, as we have concluded with some of those beginning questions about what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God, let's consider the three views throughout the history of the church that have been used to define what it means to be made in the image of God. The first is called the substantive theory. Within this particular theory, the image is inherently structural to man. That means it is related to some aspect of what man is. So it could relate to the body, it could relate to those who say it's only the soul, but it is inherent to who we are. Uh, secondly, we have the idea of the functionality of the image. That is, the image is something that man does. It relates then either to his dominion, the fact that he rules, or it relates to the aspect that he worships God, some aspect of the functional capacity of man. The third theory that is used to describe the image of God and how it relates to humanity is the relational aspect. This has been proposed more recently. Uh, that is, a relationship that is focused on the image of God. And there are really three tiers that could be used to describe the relational aspect. It could be, well, number one, of course, the maleness and the femaleness uh, of the fact that we are made in the image of God. That is a relationship of man to man as well. Also, the relationship of man to God, that is our relationship with God. But then there's also the relationship of man to creation. I think that the best way to understand what it means to be made in the image of God, that is identifying it, would to take the first view, that is the substantive view, 
that we are made in the image. It relates to who we are. These other two, the functional as well as the relational, are important, but they flow from and they are consequences of what it means to be substantively made within the image and likeness of God. Now, thankful, being very thankful to John Kilner, we have various ideas of what it means to be made in the image, and that's where we're going to move to now. We're going to talk about terms of reflection and connection, as well as dignity and destiny. So if someone were to come up to you and say, what does it mean to be made in the image and after the likeness of God, I would encourage you to remember reflection and connection. This would be very helpful. It is that we reflect or we are intended to reflect something of God. Being made in the image means that that image reflects something of the Creator. And then the idea of connection pretty obviously means that there is some type of relationship to the image. But then when we think about what are the implications of being made in the image and likeness, we're going to think about the ideas of dignity and destiny. The fact that because we are made in the image of God, we bear a certain dignity. And once again, thinking about God's intentions, He has a destiny for us. And so when we think about the ideas of the reflection and connection, we're going to think about or we're going to observe four concepts. The first concept is that of reason. The second is that of rule. The third is relationship. And the fourth is righteousness. The first concept we're going to look from a biblical perspective is that of reason. Once again, considering the creation narrative, and we think about what occurs within the expansion of of the creation of man in Genesis 2, as well as the very creation of man in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, We read in 28, God commanded man to rule the animals and to subdue the earth. The very ruling of the animals infers there's an aspect of reason or intelligence that also is involved. When we move to the second chapter, we see that God put man in the garden and he told man to cultivate and to keep or to work the garden. Also that communicates strategy which infers that man has intelligence. God brought animals to to the man to name. This assumes and um, uh, intends that there is a cognitive capacity that humanity contains. And then also, God spoke to man, and, and they also were able to communicate and were to speak to God. Then we also think about the very fact as we reflect on these truths that humanity, when we observe Humanity is creative. God himself is creative. So we are creative. We reflect many of those particular attributes. Simply put, we can compare and look at the creation that God made, and we can see that a fish swims within the ocean, but a fish does not stop, stop to contemplate what water is. And a dog, he digs a hole and he throws the bone within the hole, but he doesn't stop and write a thesis about what the hole actually means. And so in that regard, we can see that reason, from a biblical perspective, does have some warrant in relation to what exactly is the image of God. But I think, once again, the strongest arguments relates to our renewal in Jesus Christ, which we're going to be primarily tomorrow. Read in Colossians 3.10, as we are sanctified, that is, having put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of the Creator. That helps us to understand that, yes, intelligence does have an aspect of what it means to be made within the image of God. So reason in that regard. But the second aspect of what we think of when it means that we reflect the Creator being made in His image and according to His likeness relates to the rule. God commanded that humanity would have dominion over the creation. We read, for instance, in Genesis 1, 26, and let them have dominion, which means to practice authority over the fish of the sea, over the birds and the heavens, over the livestock and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. 
And as we've already read in Psalm 8, we think about David who also was given revelation of what God communicated about humanity. He said, you've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You've given him dominion over the works of your hands and you've put all things under his feet. Also recognizing, once again, the very implication of what it means to be made in the image and the use of the idea at Salem to be a representative, humanity then would be considered a vice-regent. As God would be king, humanity also then would rule in his stead on the creation that he made. When we think also about further implications of being made within the image of God, we reflect on the expansion of man being placed within the Garden of Eden, and as such, he was put there. That word put designates God's rest, his safety, and for that matter, the idea of him being within the presence. And so there's an idea of fellowship that is in, in man there to work and to keep. And so ruling over the creation God made means stewardship, being good stewards of what God has made. We're going to ref, come back and review what it means to work and to keep the garden. However, I just want you to see here there's a very intentionality of God putting Adam in the garden for his rest, for his safety, as well as that his presence would be felt. This helps us also to understand that when humanity is made in the image and according to the likeness of God, it involves reason, it involves rule, but rule and relationship often go directly hand in hand. Whether it's God himself putting man in the garden to cultivate and keep, and that idea of put has a relational overtone, or whether also we think about what it means when, uh, when man in his relationship uh, has a relationship also with God but as well with uh, other mankind. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him male and female he created them. As stated before, the focus of male and is important for a number of reasons. One, the rest of the creatures are not created, or that I should say the rest of the creatures, are, is, it is not communicated that they are created in such a capacity where you have the very emphasis on maleness and femaleness. Uh, what that should also tell us is that the focus on the maleness and the femaleness of humanity is extremely important and should be something that we hold in great reverence. Secondly, when we compare Genesis 1.27 with Genesis 2.23, at the end of the expansion of the creation narrative for humanity, whenever God created Eve from man's side or his rib, man saw Eve, he said, this is at last bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. 1.27, as I already communicated, is a poem is it has poetic structure. Well, Genesis 2.23 also is a poem, and it has poetic structure. So it very easily could be understand from the perspective uh, in looking at the text that you have two bookends of poetry. And oftentimes poetry would be a commentary on the focus of the narrative as well as an emphasis on the meaning. So there is warrant to believe it's important to recognize the relationship of the man and the woman, the maleness and the femaleness is, is, is significant when we think about what it means uh, for man to reflect the image of the creator. Also, the maleness and the femaleness of humanity, when we compare Genesis 1, 26 and 27 with Genesis chapter 5, in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, you have the plurality of God that is communicated. Let us make man. And if that is reflective of, and I think it is, of the Trinity, then you have a picture there that then also is paralleled or compared with Genesis chapter 5 where God himself made man in the singular. 
So you have the plural, you have the singular. You will also see the plural, male and female, found in 126 and 27, as well as the singular of man also stated when God made man in his likeness in Genesis chapter 5. Why is that important? Because you have an analogy, an analogy between the oneness of humanity in the plurality, male and female, that reflects the oneness of who God is as well as the triunity of how he has revealed himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not only that, but then when we look at the poetry that is used as bookends, as I stated, it tells us the great importance of recognizing the relationality of humanity in being made in the image and after the likeness. The final thing I would like to point out as we also saw God putting man in the garden to cultivate and keep, there's a relational overtone. There's also a relational overtone between the male and the female, as well as the rulership of the male and the female. How is the male and the female going to fill the earth like they are called to, and how are they going to be able to multiply, and then how are they going to subdue and over the man has his mate to help him. So once again, relationality would also connect with the rulership of humanity has been called. The female is called to help the man. God has given the man the responsibility, and so the female is to help the man. You know, these two working in unity. James Hamill communicates this as the dance of creation uh, in a very poetic format. As we continue reflecting on the idea of relationship, here you have a picture of, well, the Garden of Eden. This would be man's relation to God as um, we're, let's see here, back up here. No, I haven't got there yet. As God has placed man within the garden, I'm going to move forward just a little bit. Okay, I've skipped it, so I'm just going to go ahead and let you know. When we look at the idea or the, the concepts in Genesis chapter 2 of man guarding and serving or keeping the garden, there is a priestly hue also that is communicated. It could also be communicated the man serves and keeps, or as John Salehammer would state, the idea could be to worship and to obey. Now, th these ideas are seen also within the first of the Bible to the priests within the tabernacle. The fact we see in Numbers 3, 7 that the priests are to serve in the tabernacle. The idea of service also has the idea of worship. In Psalm 100, a psalm I think many of you are aware, whenever David cries out, serve the Lord with gladness. Or, for instance, the idea of keep would have the overtones of obey, just like we read in Deuteronomy chapter 30, where the Israelites, the contingency of them uh, being in the land and enjoying the land is based on the fact that they would keep or they would obey the commandments of the law. In both aspects, you see a priestly overtone of Adam being placed within the Garden of Eden. And so here also, I want to point out, in this particular picture, you have God's presence, you have the tree of life, you have the origin of a water source from the garden, uh, inc including the uh, Pishon, the Gihon, the Tigris, the Euphrates, as well as after humanity was uh, ki kicked out of the garden, egg of the garden, you have the cherubim that's put at the front of the garden. We know from looking at the New Jerusalem that a water source flows from the throne of God within the millennial temple in uh, Ezekiel 40 through 38. The, the river flows from the temple itself. And then when we think about the overtones of the tabernacle also indicated within the penny, you see similarity. Lamp stand, which is a picture of uh, the tree. You have the cherubim which are placed before the veil, before the very presence of God. Also within the garden, the uh, 
the very uh, entrance of the garden uh, faced east. And so if you were to head towards the presence of God, you would have to go west. The tabernacle always faced east. And if you were to enter into the presence of God, you would always have to move west. That included with the priestly hues and overtones that you see Adam, who is supposed to cultivate and keep the garden, helps us to understand the very relationality of man being made in the image of God and the fact that man is a mediator before creation. These priestly overtones. A priest was one who represented creation before God and then God before creation. That was the purpose of Adam. All right, continuing the idea of relationship, we think about how Genesis chapter 5, 1 through 3, thinking about the genealogy, communicates that God made man in his likeness, and then also Seth was made after the likeness and, and, or after, in the likeness and after the image of, of his father. But then when we think about the genealogy of Jesus, for instance, there is a reflection on this particular genealogy in Genesis chapter 5 in which Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age. And then continuing reading on in the genealogy, uh, moving from Joseph all the way down to Seth and then Adam, Adam is described as son of God. And so that is a unique term that seems to relate to Adam being made in the image. But of course, we know it's not synonymous. Why do we know it's not synonymous? Well, because not all humanity are described as sons of God. Israel was described as a son of God in Exodus chapter 4, 22 and Hosea 1, 10. And we read within the New Testament, for instance, that those who receive Christ have the right to be called children of God as well as there is a distinction that we find the Apostle Paul communicate uh, relating to those who, by faith, trust in Jesus. They are sons by adoption. So it would seem to implicate that the idea of son of God has a overtone of, or a connotation of one who is a covenant representative. That would be a good way of putting it, someone who is a covenant representative of God. And so once again, that has uh, relational overtones. So when we think about the reflections, humanity and the reflections that they have that is being made in the image and according to the likeness, they have reason or intelligence. And even now for those who are in Christ, we are being renewed in accordance with the knowledge after the image. We have rule, we've been given dominion, we've been called to be vice regents. We also have a relationship, and I would say this th three-tier relationship, a relationship with God, what we call a, a priestly type relationship. We have a relationship also with one another. Male and female would be another way of understanding that relationship. Let me say this real quickly. This doesn't mean if somebody is single that they are any less in the image of God. Remember, Jesus was single and he was the very image of God. But also, it has overtones of righteousness. That's the last aspect we're going to talk about. Righteousness or morality. Because we know when God placed him in the garden, he said, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Man had a choice. He had a moral choice. And when we think about the concepts of redemption or salvation history, man being renewed and for that matter, um, uh, sanctified and how that is pictured relating to the idea of image connected with Jesus' work. We're going to look at that tomorrow, Jesus' work on the cross. That is, we're going to see that the idea of sanctification growing in holiness is directly related to the idea of being made in the image. And so that should be very clear as we move to that subject matter tomorrow. Finally, we also read... Um, or just to give you a few overtones here, uh, or summary, God endowed man with the ability to make moral choices. He was permitted to eat of any tree in the garden except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So these would be considered the reflections and connections of what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. Now if we think about the implications of being made in the image, that would relate to the idea of dignity as well as destiny. 
let's start with the idea of dignity. When we think about the way that other cultures have perceived the creation of man, you see a contrast with that of the biblical orientation. For instance, in Mesopotamia, in Imu Elish, there's a contrast with the Bible's version of human creation. Um, and what you see within this particular passage is that man is created almost as an afterthought. Within the biblical idea of creation, man is a vice regent. Within other cultures, let's say for instance Egypt, we might or they might recognize that uh, a king or an emperor could be someone who is created or made in an image of a god, little g, uh, not recognizing the god of the Bible. But they wouldn't say that of the regular canal digger or the mason. But from a biblical perspective, we are all on an equal plane. We all are created in the image and after the likeness of God. Therefore, we all have that particular dignity. Uh, for instance, within Imu Elish, the story goes that there was a rebellion against the god Marduk. One of the fallen gods, Kingu, uh, who had died, uh, was then his, his blood was used to create humanity because by Marduk were complaining. As punishment, they had to uh, work and make sure to organize and care for the earth, and they didn't like doing it because it meant menial labor. And so in petitioning Marduk, uh, he gave them the blood of Kingu, and from that they made humanity who would serve them to do menial labor. And so once again, in this, man is considered simply to be an afterthought. When we think about the idea of dignity, and the relevance of what it means to be made in the image. That means that all humanity is in the image, including those who are handicapped, those who are unborn, and those from every race as we would understand the concept of race. That also means individuals do not contain more or less of the image and likeness. There have been those within the history of humanity who have used this concept or this idea outside the true biblical understanding for their own purposes, like Adolf Hitler in his Mein Kampf. He communicated that the stronger races were those who had the image of God. For instance, the German people, who he said descended from the Aryan race, and all the other peoples or other races that were inferior had distorted images. But from a biblical perspective, as we're going to see, um, as we see, individuals do not contain more or less of the image and likeness. Another aspect of the dignity of humanity or the implications of what it means to be made in the image and likeness means care for the environment. Um, let's call it what it is. Care for God's creation that he made and having uh, an understanding of who we are as stewards. Treatment of the body, if we recognize, if I am correct in my understanding of the image and likeness of God that the body is included, then the way that we observe the body will have implications in, 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 in what we think God did when he created us in his image and likeness. So for instance, it will have issues uh, whenever we think about um, the 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 cultural concepts of cremation. I'm a strong advocate of burial for that matter. Or whenever we think about issues like tattoos, things of that nature, being made in the image and likeness of God. And then finally, as I've already stated before, creativity. If God is creative, then let's also be creative as well. I'm gonna focus on a couple of these and advance them just a little bit further. I want to talk about the idea of care for the environment and I also want to talk about this idea of race as we think about what it means to be made in the image and after the likeness of God. First, when we think about environmental ethics, there are three major ways that environmental ethics have been pursued. The first is, the first is anthropocentrism. Anthropocentrism means that the idea of humanity is at the center 
of our environmental ethics and our care for the environment. Human values and human interests are preeminent. And this, of course, has a few problems. One is the fact that humanity is not the ultimate center of what we think about when we think about the care of God's creation or the environment. And secondly, they have a tendency that is this particular perspective of anthropocentrism to only look at that which is useful to humanity. And nature is intrinsically value whether we as a culture sees it useful to humanity or not. The second way in which we view environmental ethics is biocentrism. Biocentrism would be very different than anthropocentrism in that biology, or I should say nature itself, is at the center of focus. Oftentimes biocentrism uh, is something that also has pantheistic overtones, that is many who who take this particular position see a type of divinity in all of the creation, including humanity. And of course, the weaknesses are it simply ignores God and His plans and His purposes for the creation that He made. And then finally, the way I would encourage us to think about the care of the environment or the care of the creation that God made is more from a theocentrism perspective. Reflect everything. He for his glory and therefore the value of desiring to care for the creation relates to who we are as made in the image and likeness of God carrying forth the mandate that God has given to us and knowing that meaning, purpose, value all relies directly in who God is and then who we are in God. When we think about race considerations I know that that's a big issue today these, I, this idea of race but let me say this, the idea that we think about race, that is different colors making up different races, is actually foreign to a biblical perspective. You see, when we think about the idea of race from a biblical perspective, especially well, looking at the idea of genos within the New Testament, you did have... Um, different groups who identified, but they identified according to kinship, line, ethnicity, nationality, or cultural patterns. The idea of genos is best translated as a nation or a people group. Race, as it relates to differing color of skin, is something that is recent when we think about the whole history of humanity and developed within the late 15th century. And in fact, we think about the fact that um, when we see these divisions and the idea of superiority of one race to another, another as it relates to the idea, once again, of skin, it is something that has developed within the late 19th century. I mean, there were some in the early 19th century, but especially within the latter 19th century, and it flowed from an appeal to Darwinian evolution. From a biblical perspective, we know that there is no distinction between various people groups for that matter because all in Christ uh, are united. Having put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after Jesus, there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, scythian, slave or free man, but Christ is all in all. And there will also come a day, as many of you reflecting on Revelation chapter 5, 9, know that we will stand around the throne, those from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and we will worship the Lamb who is worthy to take the seal and open it because he was slain from the foundation of the world. And that idea of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation is reflective of the table of nations that we read about in Genesis chapter 10, which are the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, each made... Uh, once again, similar overtones of tribe, tongue, people, and nation. So going back, humanity has dignity. Humanity also has destiny. And as I close with the idea of destiny, this is really what we're going to be talking about primi primarily tomorrow during the session when I look at the image and salvation history what is the destiny of humanity relating to be made in the image of God? Let me say this. This is very important. Jesus Christ is both the standard as well as the enabler of the image. 
We read, for instance, in Colossians 1, 15 through 17, He is the image of the invisible God. I want you to notice this. It doesn't say that He is in the image, and it doesn't say He is after the image. It says He is the image of God. It's very important when we think about the distinction of Jesus, and then for that matter, who we are is made in the image. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. By Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, with their thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. And he is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. One more thing I want to try to communicate before I do need to conclude, and because this is very important, and that is the idea of glory. The idea of glory connected with the idea of image. For instance... We read in 2 Corinthians 3.18, something that we're going to focus a lot more time on tomorrow, that image and glory are connected. They're not the same. They're not synonymous. We read, for instance, in verse 18, we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now, just to give you a little introduction... So Jesus is the image of God. We are made in the image, and that image is, in a sense, being restored. It's being restored is because of Jesus through the process of sanctification, which is what 2 Corinthians 3.18 is talking about. We are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. That is, there is something that changes that's glory. There are various degrees of glory, but the image does not change. When we think about God in relation to the idea of glory, oftentimes we think of the concept of Shekinah glory. That is, that light that emanates from the beauty of His attributes. I think that would be a good way of reflecting on what it means to think about God's glory. We know that man was crowned with glory and honor. And so a good passage to go to to think about what Paul is communicating as well as how image and glory relate is found in Exodus chapter 33, verse 18. In this passage, the children of Israel have been, uh, they have, uh, been able to be removed from Egypt. They've experienced the Exodus. They have gone to Sinai. And Moses has gone up on the mountain. Now, the people of God have been worshiping an idol, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. And yet Moses, as he is up on the mountain, asks God to show him his ways. Specifically, Moses says, please show me your glory. Now, we also know that the goodness of God passes by, and as the goodness of God passes by, after God puts Moses into the cleft of the rock, we read, The Lord, Lord God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Here's what I want to communicate. Oftentimes that has befuddled Bible students. Why, whenever Moses said, I want to see your glory, and when God passes by, he communicates his attributes of mercy and grace and steadfast love and faithfulness? Because there are different ways that we need to understand the glory of God. There is what we might call the manifested glory of God. That would be the Shekinah glory. That is the glory that the Apostle Paul talks about in describing Jesus to Timothy, who dwells in unapproachable light. That would be what the rabbis of old called the Shekinah. That is, Shekan, which means to dwell. Yahweh dwells the emanating light from his very beauty. But then you have what I'm going to call the attributive glory of God. This is the glory that relates to God's attributes. And when God could not show Moses his face, because to see that glory he would not live, he showed him his backside. The backside relates to his attributive glory. It is this type of glory that we read about in 2 Corinthians 3.18 as we change and are transformed in one degree of glory to another. 
that is that we will emulate the attributes of God, of His mercy, of His justice, of His faithfulness, of His goodness. So in this, that is what it means to be made in the image and after the likeness of God that, as David says, we were crowned with glory and honor that the intention of man was to reflect the very glory of God in displaying His attributes, His goodness, His mercy, and His justice before His created world. As R.C. Sproul so states, but what uniquely stamps us as bearing the image of God has to do with our ability to mirror and to reflect the character of God. The image that God gave us the likeness that He has put in us as creatures, in an ability to show what it means to be holy. And my friends, tomorrow how this is accomplished is found in the story of redemption. I close, finally, with this hymn from Charles Wesley. The Charles Wesley that brought us Hark the Herald Angels Sing in his omnipotent or omnipresent God in me, Lord, thyself reveal. Fill me with a sweet surprise. Let me thee, when walking, feel. Let me in thy image rise. Oh, that I might know thee mine. Oh, that I might thee receive. Only live the life divine. Only to thy glory live.